So maybe we should go around the table and introduce uh, everyone? Or what, what do you think? That, that would probably be a good, good thing. <laughs> uh, I've already introduced you a lot. In fact, they've heard so much about you that uh, <laughs> but perhaps you could also uh, tell us about the latest development from your side as well. Because I know that you... No, 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 I prefer to to about you first. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so, well, you all know uh, me, so I don't need to introduce myself. Maybe we just go around the table? Yes? Just who you are. <laughs> yes, say who you are, very important. <laughs> I'm Laura. Yes? No. <laughs> no, no, say, say what you are, what your background is, you know. That's um, I have a Bachelor of International Studies and a Bachelor of Commerce, and I'm doing my Master's in European and International Studies. Okay, good. Okay, uh, I'm Alexander, I'm a Danish exchange student. I'm doing a Bachelor in International Business and Politics. Um, um, my name is Jan Hauser. I'm a PhD researcher at Charles University in Prague, uh, the Czech Republic, and I'm here on an exchange uh, through the Erasmus Mundus program, which is wonderful. And I also run a business back in Prague, so I'm really looking forward to learning how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes. And uh, I'm a French intern at the Monash Europe Center, and my background is a degree in political science and law. Um, I'm Vue Lua, I'm South African and I have a Bachelor in International Studies and Marketing and now I'm doing my Masters in European and International Studies. Hi, I'm Jennifer, I'm Spanish and I have a Bachelor in Linguistics and Translation but I'm also doing International Studies. And uh, I'm Alex. Okay. okay, can you bring the mic and can you hear us? Yes, yes. Uh, I'm Alex. I did a Bachelor of Arts in Politics and History. Now I'm doing a Master of European and International Studies. And I'd like to say that Steve Stern couldn't come, unfortunately, Daniel, but he, we're recording this, so he'll be watching this, and I'm going to put the two of you in, in touch. But he, he just had the last minute engagement, so he was running and then trying to find a taxi, and uh, so that's that's also why I'm late, okay. another reason. <laughs> so. <laughs> So it was a, a bit uh, of a strange day that way. So, no so we're all here, and no I don't know how you want to start, perhaps with a presentation and interrupting. Um, you know, you used Yes, yes, uh, as usual. I mean, uh, the, 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 the discussion needs to be there. It will be very interactive. Uh, so the idea somewhere is that to give uh, uh, an overview of uh, the big dossiers at uh, EU level uh, first, perhaps, and then after to enter. Uh, more in uh, in uh, how the machinery works uh, and uh, what are the rules for uh, for freelancing and then for lobbying. Uh, but uh, I should like to open uh, the, the discussion uh, immediately. Uh, so don't hesitate to uh, interrupt me or to ask questions uh, at any moment. Is it is it fine for you? Yes. Uh, I ask them to prepare questions so that it's not okay to not no, have no, questions. No, no, no. They will give them. Time the so yeah. I will I will start the presentation. Uh, uh, perhaps I have to introduce me, or you did already? I, I did, but I, I would prefer you to, to add to the introduction, because there's always latest development that I don't know about, because so, it's so <laughs> dynamic that then I find out about the latest, <laughs> latest myself, actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, well, uh, what I can say is that uh, I am uh, I working for uh, lobbying uh, at EU level since, uh, since a very long time, by the way. I'm not so old, I am 63, but uh, I have started uh, in European Affairs in 1975, so it's uh, nearly 40 years. And I am probably the uh, oldest uh, lobbyist in Brussels, not, not by age, but by, by length of, uh, of career. Uh, this is uh, important because uh, lobbying is very based on, uh, on uh, experience. Uh, in lobbying, of course, you, you need uh, to have uh, knowledge and techniques and whatsoever, but the experience is, is very key, as I will explain during this, this session. Uh, so, uh, by background, uh, I, I am a lawyer, uh, but also I am graduated in uh, finance and, uh, and economy, which I think is good to, to cover a relatively uh, large scope of uh, interest, which is important for, for lobbying as well. And uh, I have started uh, my, my career 
uh, with uh, collective representation. I mean, what we call EU trade uh, associations. So these are uh, sectorial lobbying, if you wish. And uh, somewhere I have uh, been the head of the best lobby in Europe and of the worst lobby in Europe, which is a bit particular. So I have been lucky, uh, young, to be appointed head of uh, the European Sugar Association. And uh, of course, uh, sugar for Australia is a very important commodity, but for, for Europe also, and uh, it was uh, really a, a war machine for, for lobbying. And lobbying is very important for industry and for sugar in particular, uh, because uh, we succeeded uh, to avoid any WTO commitment. So WTO was very detrimental for European agriculture, and sugar, thanks to a very effective lobbying strategy, has escaped any WTO commitment, which was a, a great victory. Then after, uh, I, I took uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the leadership or the management of the most uh, important lobby in Europe, agriculture, uh, farmers' union, uh, and uh, it was somewhere the, the worst lobby in town. Very, very uh, negative, uh, asking for subsidies, uh, using a lot of, uh, of public funds, and uh, having no vision uh, of uh, how to uh, influence uh, in, a, in a positive way uh, the legislature. And uh, after 18 months, uh, I thought it was enough, and I left uh, to create my own company. So it was an interesting uh, initiative because uh, I like to be an entrepreneur, so it was uh, nearly 20 years since, 20 years ago. And the company expanded. Uh, in the company, we had several branches. We had uh, a, a consulting branch on, on, EU, uh, on EU affairs, uh, but also a lot of training, uh, also in media with a press agency. And uh, progressively, uh, the company expanded, and uh, I sold it. And then I recreated another one, which is uh, you see on the screen, Pact European Affairs. And Pact European Affairs is uh, is uh, an interesting. Uh, Company, it's a, it's a it's a small one now because we are part uh, January, but it's a very uh, uh, we are very much in a niche. Uh, I will have to explain you that uh, lobbying now it's more and more legal, it's more and more open. We are specialized in the company in in the uh, hidden power. Uh, you will see that in Brussels you have the visible power. Uh, with the Parliament and uh, with the Commission and uh, with the States, with the Council of Ministers, but also we have a very important hidden power, uh, which is producing a hell of legislation. Uh, the, the visible power is producing uh, uh, 50 texts, more or less 50 laws per year, but the hidden power, the secondary legislation, if you wish, is producing uh, nearly 2,000 to 3,000 regulations per year so it's uh, more important and we are specialized in that and it's it's very fun by, by the way uh, because uh, we are more or less the only one in Brussels to, to, to really master these uh, complex uh, procedures. Mm -hmm. uh, the actuality for me uh, Pascaline is an interesting one because uh, uh, we have been asked by a small uh, uh, laboratory for, for drugs uh, to assist them in a very uh, tough dossier in Brussels because uh, the Commission is against the registration of one of their medicine, uh, which is uh, what we call an orphan medicine. You know, an orphan medicine, you have very uh, little number of users and uh, sick people. There are only 19, uh, one nine uh, sick people in Europe for this disease. It's incredible. It's very, very small. And this is a medicine for very young children and to avoid a liver transplant. And it's a medicine which is for since 20 years and doing very well, very accepted by all the medical community. But the registration of the product to put the product on the market is rejected by the Commission for very mysterious reason. And it's a big, big, big battle now in Brussels for this a little product which is now appearing symbolic of uh, the unbalanced power between the Commission who is taking more and more power and the member states uh, who are not affected by the Commission. So it's very fun to be engaged in this uh, dossier uh, and you see that uh, lobbying is uh, something uh, extremely operational uh, and active and uh, in the actuality. So this is for the introduction. So. Uh, 
uh, you see now my CV, but I think uh, I said enough on what I do. I have uh, now an academic uh, uh, role, uh, not only for ULB, because uh, I did uh, the uh, role pool, uh, of lobbying uh, this year, because uh, Pascaline uh, took uh, a year uh, of, uh, of leave uh, for writing a book, and but I'm also a contributor at the College of Europe. You see, for comitology, it's a curious word, but comitology means all these opaque procedures, these secondary uh, regulations, and uh, the College of Europe is asking a practitioner to teach about that, uh, because it's something extremely uh, operational. There is no theory behind, it's really uh, action, uh, legal action. You, you see uh, here uh, on the, the graph uh, the concept of uh, my new company. Uh, you see uh, there is a pre-Lisbon and a post-Lisbon uh, phase. So wh what it means? Uh, it means uh, that uh, the member states, uh, after long discussions, years of discussions, have uh, decided uh, a new reform of uh, the uh, European institutions, which is called the Lisbon Treaty. And the Lisbon Treaty was supposed to be just a, a technical treaty, a, a minor treaty, if you wish. And uh, in, in reality, we see that the, the, the Lisbon Treaty is, is bringing a hell of changes for the worst, in my opinion, by the way. Uh, it's, uh, I think, a very, very bad treaty, but never mind, it exists. And uh, you have uh, the complexity of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the system before and after Lisbon, uh, as you can see. The orange curve uh, is explaining the complexity of, of the issues, of the topics. So what do we mean by the issues? Agriculture is an issue, energy is an issue, transport, environment, uh, food, uh, all that. And you see that the complexity is not growing so much before and after Lisbon. On the contrary, uh, the, the blue curve uh, uh, represents the complexity of procedures, the complexity of the decision-making process. Uh, and here you see that it's a boom and that uh, the procedures are becoming awfully complex and opaque. Uh, and what is interesting uh, in Brussels uh, is that you have uh, thousands of experts on the issues, you have thousands of experts on uh, agriculture or automotive or energy or whatsoever, but you have very, very, very few experts on, on the decision-making process. And uh, my new company, Pact European Affairs, is specialized in these complex procedures. And uh, our motto is uh, to say to the client, you client, you master the topic, we master the procedures. And uh, a winning team for lobbying is to have an alliance between someone be uh, a top expert in the field and a top expert in the procedure. So it's a new concept uh, for, for lobbying and it's uh, very interesting to, to have built uh, this uh, new structure. So is it clear, uh, Pascaline? Mm -hmm. Yeah, very clear. Yeah, excellent. Yes? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. They agree. <laughs> 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 so, okay, so a question at the state or a question of me? Any questions so far? No? Not so far. Okay, so perhaps uh, if, you, if you agree, I, I will uh, start uh, with uh, somewhere a, a presentation and then a discussion about uh, the uh, EU in general the place of the EU in the world, the, the big uh, dossiers uh, that uh, are discussed right now, uh, because the period is, is interesting uh, with the uh, Euro crisis and uh, with the uh, economic problem uh, in Europe. Uh, I have perhaps to say first that uh, personally uh, I am a, a very strong pro-European. I believe very much in uh, the European Union. I am a federalist since ever. But uh, I am very unsatisfied uh, on the way that the EU is uh, presently managed. I think it's, it's really not acceptable uh, to see how this uh, region, uh, Europe is the main economic power in the world, is uh, so much on the defensive and is so much uh, confronted to uh, difficulties with no solution. I mean, I believe uh, personally that uh, the present difficulties have solutions and uh, there is a, an incredible uh, lack of leadership. And uh, when you travel in the world, you see how there is a great dynamism in the other parts of the world, so in your country in particular, but also uh, in South America, or in China, or in India, or 
even now in Africa and in Europe, we are so much on, on the defensive, and uh, we are so keen to uh, to complain against ourselves that uh, it's somewhere uh, disesperant for me uh, when I believe that uh, we have a lot to do uh, and we have a lot of assets. The next slide is uh, uh, is explaining that the EU, we like it or not, uh, is extremely important, and that uh, the center of power uh, are not uh, is not uh, the capital. Uh, you know, the EU is composed of uh, 27 member states. Uh, the, the French believe that the power belongs to Paris, uh, but no, <laughs> the power belongs to, to Brussels. Uh, and you see that 75 percent of national laws have uh, EU origin. Uh, yesterday, uh, uh, I was moderating a debate uh, with uh, a French uh, official civil servant on, on health, and uh, he was uh, explaining that for, for health, uh, the majority of the laws are also coming from Brussels, and for environment, uh, the percentage even is higher, uh, around 80% of the, of the relation for environment are coming from Brussels. So it's really a, a, key, a key place and a place uh, to be. Uh, and also, it's interesting because uh, we have, uh, uh, since uh, two years, uh, a new commission, a new parliament, uh, a new council. So what do we mean by this? Uh, in fact, uh, the uh, European Union is working uh, around a, a triangle, which is uh, very particular. Uh, at national level, the decision-making process is organized vertically. So you have a president of the Republic, or you have a queen, or you have a king, then after you have a government and you have a parliament or a senate, so it's very vertical. Uh, in, at EU level, it's uh, very different. You, you have a, tri a triangle uh, with a commission uh, representing uh, the, the general interest of uh, the citizens, if you wish. Uh, the, the commission is somewhere in the administration. It's the engine of the car, uh, proposing the laws, managing the system. And uh, these uh, laws proposed by the Commission are adopted uh, jointly, generally, by the Parliament, uh, which is representing the, the citizens, and the Council of Ministers, which is representing the 27 member states. So the machinery is organized in this way, uh, simply because the EU is not a state, uh, so the Commission is not a government, and, uh, but the EU is more than an international institution. So it's a, it's a structure which is growing, working well. Uh, but uh, the Lisbon Treaty, again, has changed the system. And the Commission has uh, been ro rotated uh, two years ago because they are appointed for, for five years. That's what we call the commissioners. The Parliament is also uh, elected for five years. So we are in a new uh, environment. In this new environment, I have put on the next uh, slide, what are the key issues? Well, we, we have, we, we, if I want to be a bit provocative, uh, I will say that the EU is regulating a lot. Uh, as I have said, uh, producing uh, more or less uh, 3,000 regulations per year. Uh, but somewhere, uh, I believe, they, they mostly regulate on, on the size of concombers. So uh, they regulate more or less on peanuts. When, well, when you are a concomber producer, of course, the size of the concombers is a very important topic for you. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, what is uh, amazing now is that uh, the, the Commission and, and the institutions are regulating technical details and uh, missing a, a global vision of, uh, of the European Union uh, at large and uh, the relations between the European Union and, and the rest of, of the world. So it's a, it's a pity for me uh, to see that they, they see the detail and, and they don't see a, a global picture. And this is uh, particularly true uh, when you see the, the two main priorities of, of, of the day. Uh, the two main uh, priorities of the day are, of course, the euro. And now the question is on the table, is the euro sustainable? And the second question, uh, which is connected, is about European economic harmonization. Uh, the uh, performance of the European countries are strongly diverging. And uh, we see that uh, we have only uh, one very good pupil in the classroom. This is Germany, due to uh, a very uh, performing organization and also very strong reforms. 
Germany now is, uh, is in very good shape. They are reducing their budgetary deficits. They are uh, reducing their debt. Uh, they have uh, relatively good growth. Uh, they are decreasing uh, the unemployment rate. In other terms, uh, they are doing well. Uh, on the contrary, at the rear of the classroom, we have a number of very bad pupils. Uh, the worst pupil, and his case is desperate, and I'm afraid he will have to leave the classroom, is Greece. Greece is a, is a third world country, let's say the things as they are. Uh, performance is absolutely a disaster. There is no organization, there is a big fraud, there are, there are a lot of corruptions, and they don't improve the system. On the contrary, the system is becoming worse and worse, and there is no economic performance. The southern flank uh, of the European Union is also in, in difficulties, in particular uh, Spain and Portugal and Italy. But Spain is in very, very bad shape. I was in, in Spain uh, recently for my vacations, and I, I was absolutely surprised to see how uh, the Spanish economy is, is stopped. Uh, you know, I, I know very well Spain, I've been very, uh, very often in Spain, and the Spanish people, they like to eat and like to drink, and they go to the restaurant and they order food and drink and, and wine. It's favor. And, and, and here, you see no one in the restaurant, you see no one in the bar, they just take a little glass of beer and nothing else. You know, it's, it's, it's really, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, very sad, I must say. Uh, you have again around Germany uh, a relatively efficient uh, zone, with, which was before the...